once you're in conflict with the external world and the internal world, mm. it's very hard to find center or what our true north is, right? You think about what you write down, your mission, vision, and values for who you are, that's your north. But when you're in conflict in the external world and the internal world, it's very hard to decide what your mission, vision, and values are for yourself and where true north is. You're constantly living in this world of trying to meet expectations for others whom you probably love or care about, but also you have this internal mechanism that's saying, I'm supposed to quit this job. Mm. I'm not supposed to go to college. I'm supposed to start this side business or become a tattoo artist because even though I'm really good at mathematics and engineering, the creative side of my person really loves this idea of tattooing and it should be something that I can support my life on, but you don't want to disappoint the people that want you to use your engineering gift and mathematics mm -hmm. to go get a higher education, maybe work for Google or something, but mm -hmm. inside you, you know that that will never make you happy. Shit's about to go down. I'm feeling something in my spirit. Chops and Tats with Aaron Della Vidova. Hey, friends, lovers of art, creative, magnificent souls of planet Earth. Welcome back to Chats and Tats with me, your host, Aaron Della Vidova. The guy I'm having on today is the epidist, not the epidist, the all-time maybe greatest story of redemption. Uh, I'll highlight this. This is a man who was at the top of his game as an athlete in high school, was headed to the stars for various reasons, got addicted to drugs, which led to heroin of all drugs. Um, ended up going to prison for committing crimes to get money for drugs. And while in prison, completely turned his life around to get back out, to become a pro BMXer once again, and then to coach the BMX Olympic team, and then to move on to become a professional, one of the most watched professional motivational speakers in the world, and open his own rehab center for people with these similar struggles just in the last two years. So obviously was able to create a ton of success in spite of all the hardships he had been through and the little micro stories we get in today, his time in prison, how he got tattooed in prison. He's covered in tattoos um, and his, his way of surviving his prison time uh, and training while he was in there the whole time, his mindset around the whole thing is fascinating and a lot of other caveats in between. So if any of that sounded interesting to you, this is the episode for you. And here we go. Please welcome my guest today, the Mr. Great Tony Hoffman. Tony. Thank you for coming down, making the trip to come visit me here at Chats and Tats. I really appreciate it, man. Thank you so much. Grateful to be here. Thanks for and having I me. And I have to say a shout out to Michael Moulton, who was on the show, who talked to me about you. Yeah. That guy is fantastic. And uh, that's how we connected. So thank you, Michael. Appreciate it. A lot of you out there might not know Tony Hoffman is sitting with me. You might not know his story. He definitely has one. And he's created a lot of beautiful things because of his story. So maybe for those on my show that don't know who you are or what you're all about, yeah. you know, give us give us some highlights of, of what it's all about. For sure. You. I, I'll introduce you as what I do today. Okay. Um, I'm a motivational speaker, so to speak. I hate to say that, but I travel about 250 days a Why year. Why do you hate to say that? I just don't like the term motivational speaker because any Tom, Dick, and Mary can pick up a microphone, change their bio to motivational speaker and pick up some buzzwords and start telling people that they are one of the biggest speakers in the world. And they're just buzzwords flying around. Mm -hmm. It's just not what I do. I tell my story and I tell my story in niche places mm -hmm. that fit with what my actual purpose and mission in life is mm -hmm. to do. And a lot of that mission is to help people understand mental health from a degree or an angle that was never given to them that helps them better understand people like myself, help people understand addiction, how it really works, why it starts, mm -hmm. and uh, give people the inspiration that it doesn't matter where your life is at, according to how I've made changes of mm -hmm. going from prison and accomplishing getting to the Olympics as a coach in 2016, mm -hmm. after being homeless and strung out on all types of drugs, that you truly can make drastic changes in your life. And it doesn't have to just be from drugs. It could be from any situation that you're facing in your life. So that's what I do. And I hate to call myself a motivational speaker because it's never what I wanted to be. I just wanted to make a difference in people's lives. And uh, I'm now a co-founder of PH Wellness, which is a drug and alcohol treatment facility located in Southern California, Riverside, Cal uh, California. Okay. And we focus on helping stabilize individuals through their first 30 days of treatment. 
from drugs and alcohol. But as we'll go into other things, I've had a plethora of things that I've accomplished over the last, you know, 15, 16 years since I was incarcerated in 2007 through the end of 2008. Well, look, we're going to find a new word for your, what you do, motivational speaker. I, I'm going to, I'm going to figure it yeah. out. I, Cause you know, there is a big, there is a lot of motive and a lot of them, how to make you rich. Yeah. And that's what comes to mind. Motivational speaker, you're going to teach me how to make money. Right. And yeah. uh, that's not what you're doing. No, totally different angle. So we'll, we'll put that out in the universe. We're going to come up with a different way to, to describe you. <laughs> yeah. I, and I don't sell programs and I'll never sell programs. I don't want you to buy into my mastermind. I, uh, I, I get it. It's just never going to be me. I yeah. got other things that make me feel better than how to teach people how to be rich and buying into my program that makes me rich. Yeah. Well, being rich is the result of the type of changes you're talking about. If it's even part of your goal in life, but sure. uh, that it's the result of uh, you're, you're getting down to the core. You're getting down to what the foundation of a human being. Um, and for, I, I don't even use the word happiness really, because happiness is so fleeting, right? Chasing happiness sure. is like, is like an addict, right? Sure. And it, it's an addictive behavior. You know, a lot of people, they don't do heroin like you did, yep. but they, uh, they buy shit online all day sure. because every time a little box shows up from Amazon, they get that little dopamine rush. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that's, and they're seeking ha quote unquote happiness. I like to use the word fulfillment yep. to be fulfilled, which includes having a, a hard day, but a day of accomplishment and it was tough and it sucked, but you got through it and you got it done. That's fulfillment. I go to bed sometimes after a rough day, feeling better and more fulfilled than I do going to bed on a vacation. Sure. But I've done nothing all day, you know? So, yeah, and you know when you get home that you're going to have a bunch more stuff to do because you put it off for the vacation. Yeah. <laughs> so you're stressed on that and there's anxiety that comes with it. Oh, gosh. And I'm big on words. Um, fulfillment's great. Contentment is what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. And that is just my ability to go to bed at night and know that I don't need anything else. Mm -hmm. And that where I'm at right now is exactly where I'm supposed to be, mm -hmm. whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. And um, things don't help me get there. Uh, achievements don't help me get there. Um, it's a self-reflective process that helps me get there. And sobriety is a big part of that mm -hmm. self-reflective process. It's really a superpower. And you hear a lot of people in recovery say that. And for me, it is, is because I deny people, places, and things uh, the opportunity to change my mood in a way that distracts me from the moment that I'm in. And that's the most important time in my life is the moment that I'm in, what I'm feeling, and how I can process those feelings and emotions and make a better decision based on some logic around what those feelings mean and where I'm trying to go in my life um, and what exactly I want. And sometimes I need to be in a place of struggle and I can go to bed at night and find gratitude in that struggle because I know it's taking me to some better place if, as long as I stay the course. Hallelujah. No, you've nailed it. I mean, you can read a hundred books on Buddhism or Taoism or uh, uh, philosophical texts and they're all going to tell you that in some form or another. That's right. You know, being present in the moment is the place to be in that moment. If you can find gratitude for the good, the bad, the ugly, then you're basically saying to the universe, I'm okay. I have enough. That's and right. what do you, what you feel you are is what you attract. So if you're saying I have enough, you'll attract more of that. Yeah. Right. But if you're uh, pining for something or wanting something and that that frequency that happens inside of us, then you'll attract the wanting of things. Sure. Which means lack of things. You're yeah. basically saying, I don't have enough. Yeah. So the universe goes, OK, I'll keep you right in that place you seem to want to be wanting things, not having enough. That's that's your mode. That's yeah. your mode. Yeah. Yeah. And it's constantly fleeting, like you said. Oh, it's, 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 or, uh, you know, I'm a spiritual person. It, it would be considered vanity, right? You, you, you grab to go grab a hold of it and then you open up your hand and it's not there. Mm. It's not actually what you think it is. And so then you never find yourself in a place of fulfillment um, because you're, you're just going whatever direction the wind blows. That's why it has to be a practice. You know, you have to, yeah, I always, I guess as a younger man, I, I thought I would read the right book or do the right meditation or take the right hallucinogenic uh, yeah, and the magic and, pill. And I could, yeah. And I could check that box and be like, there we go. I'm in the zone. And, uh, the reality was on all of those experiences, a month goes by or whatever, and the same shit's happening and the same negative thoughts are happening. And, you know, and I have developed my own practice. One of the things I do is I I've written down a, what you might call a mission statement, what I'm about, what I want, where I'm headed, who I am. And uh, I just get up in the morning, I read it. I just read it to myself, you know, and I edit it a little bit at yeah, each of course, day. Yeah. And it's like really redundant, but man, it, it's so effective because it reminds me of it. Every, it's the practice. You got to, it's like the gym. Enlightenment's like the gym. You think you're going to go get buff and then you're done? 
walk away. Yeah. You got the muscles. You did that. No, you got to keep going. You yeah. Know? And as soon as you stop, you regress. Yes. It's, a, it's an interesting process. But that process you're talking about is really what started a lot of the struggles that I end up having in my life was trying to find a magic pill or trying to find a magic activity or something that could change or alter the mood that I was in that I didn't really like about myself. And without recognizing that it wasn't going to be something in the external world that fixed these things that I was looking to fix, it was gonna actually be a commitment to self and understanding myself to the degree that the things on the external world were no longer a necessity for me, that my peace actually came from me and that I was uh, truly in control of that myself and only I could give that away. Nobody had the power to take that from me. True, no truer words ever spoken. And you know, one of the things that's interesting about your story, you, you really didn't come from a bad home. No, you, there was no abuse. You have a good, you have a good family. They raised you right. Yeah, you st stability. Yep. You were a talented young man, talented athlete. You know, I have a similar story. I mean, I had a little bit of stuff. My parents got divorced, but there was no real abuse. But you know, I went through times of feeling depression and things like this. And you went through that in a very extreme way. Yep. What do you think? Being that you didn't have any trauma, really. Sure. Uh, unless you want to, unless there's something I don't know about. No. Where do you think that comes from? You think that's genetic, or do you think it's can you talk towards that? Where yeah, does sure. that come from? Like you should be a happy kid with yeah, everything right. you had. Yeah. Mom and dad married 48 years in November, November 6, 48 years. Right. Grew up upper middle class. My parents grinded it out though. My dad dropped out of high school to become a truck driver. Grandpa who lived down here in Benita with my mom, my dad was from El Cajon, uh, says you can't marry my daughter without $5,000 in the bank. So my dad says, I love this woman so much. I'm going to drop out of school, go get a job, save $5,000. In fact, my mom's grandparents wouldn't even go into the wedding because they didn't believe that my man or my dad was a man enough to wow. take the, their granddaughter. That's hardcore. Hardcore. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, to this day, my dad is one of the best examples of a, a man and a father and a husband that I've seen in my life. And so I did grow up in a very ideal situation. Mm -hmm. Uh, they were workaholics, uh, and that was probably the biggest piece of trauma, if you wanted to call it that, mm -hmm. is that uh, they were very invested in work and providing for the family from a financial standpoint, not only for me and my brother, but also for themselves in their retirement. You know, my dad has been a very vision-oriented person with his finances and did not want to be in a place where me and my brother were having to wheel mom and around in a wheelchair that if they needed to go into a home that they would have saved the money for the care that they would need in the, in the fourth quarter of their life. And so with that came a lot of abandonment, mm -hmm. not intentional, mm -hmm. unintentional abandonment. When we take that and then we add in the component of what the three indicators that we know from a scientific standpoint are what may lead a person into the addiction realm versus somebody that can just recreationally use substances and walk away from it and not have an experience where they're overly obsessed with the feeling that they get is that the environment, the genetics, and the psychology are the three things that play the biggest role in whether a person's gonna become addicted to a substance. We do know that if we go into neighborhoods where mom and dad are engaged in violence and drug abuse or sexual abuse are occurring, that this environment creates an emotional process or stimulus to an individual that creates very discomforting emotions. Mm -hmm. And those emotions are typically the precursor to why somebody would use a substance and find some attractiveness to how the reward system works neurologically in the brain. The second one is genetics. In my family, we do have alcoholics and addicts that have been in the family. Mm -hmm. They do believe that that plays a role in it. The third part is the one that I try to tell people weighed the heaviest on me. When I got to my teenage years, I started to feel this self-hatred that I didn't understand. And it really was centered around me feeling like I didn't belong in the location at school with these other peers. Part of that was me being such an exceptional athlete and being better than other athletes and not wanting to be better than uh, other athletes, wanting to be normal, and then having social anxiety and not knowing that's what I actually had. So I didn't know how to navigate social anxiety because I don't even know what it is. I just know I'm uncomfortable and I don't want to be around people. So I start to isolate away from people. At this time, I need answers to navigate this emotional world mm -hmm. because what I'm doing with myself is taking these emotions and I'm creating self-destructive stories mm -hmm. about who I am, what my value is, what this means about me in comparison to my peers. And then I have the component where my father's my hero He's not around because he's working 14 hours a day and he's missing a lot of these core components of 
where I need him to be, which is at my basketball games. My first dream was to go to the NBA, not be a professional BMX racer. And while I'm missing him from these events, I'm taking my internal dialogue about what I'm already struggling with. And now I'm attaching my dad's unintentional abandonment to this. And I've created the answer. And that is something's wrong with me. And in there, was there also you know, as a, as a guy that was just naturally born with a athletic talent, I would imagine there was a lot of people putting, maybe not like directly, but pressure. Basically the world's kind of saying to you, the world expects you to be great, right? Yes. Which I, is also something that I think would, that, that had to play into that, right? I hated that expectation and right. I got it starting in fourth grade. If I lose this game today, if I don't perform well, that reflects on my self-worth more than other kids. These and, kids could come play a half-ass game and no one gives them shit. But if, you know, if, if you do, then. So Mr. Ford, who I'm friends with now, I hated him growing up because of the expectations he put on me. Mostly I felt like he was picking on me. Right. Wait, he, who's Mr. Ford? He was my basketball coach in, oh, okay. from fourth grade to sixth grade. Okay. But still today, one of the only teachers that really poured into me through what I now know is true love. Mm -hmm. um, and that is that we hold those who, whom we love to a, a high expectation and accountability for self and behavior. And he saw that I was exceptional at basketball and I truly had potential to do it. And he tried to show me what the pathway of being successful in sport was going to be, mm. how to be a leader, show up on time, have a positive attitude, do the work that you don't want to do with 100% effort. So when you get to the things that you do want to do, you know how to give it 150% effort. The problem with that was he wasn't doing that to everybody else, mm. right? Just like you said. Okay. Then it's like, why are you doing this to me? Mm. I want to be like my teammates. Mm. You know, he says, Hoffman, don't you want to be a champion? Mm. And I said, no. I want you to leave me alone. Mm -hmm. I just want to be normal like my teammates. I didn't want to carry that weight because by that point in sixth grade, I had already started to feel less than. I already started to feel kind of those emotions that were making me feel like this negative vibrancy within myself. And so him telling me these things about how I could be great were in direct conflict with how I felt about myself, mm. not seeing that what he was doing was calling me to a better version of myself. And then my potential wasn't so much about needing to be a champion, but it was about creating a stage or a platform in which I could make others better through my own leadership for myself. Mm. But I didn't want that. And that's what really started this resentment for my gift was mm. every time I played a sport, it didn't matter what it was, bro. I put on a pair of rollerblades sponsored by K2 in a year. Get on a skateboard. I'm at the, you know, Long's Drugs uh, down the street showing up every high school kid that's on a skateboard. Mm. If I pick up a baseball bat or a pick up a baseball, I'm on the all-star team pitching and every mm. coach or every coach wants me to be the pitcher for the big games because I had an arm. Put me on the football team in elementary school. I was the quarterback, the running back, the cornerback, and I did the kickoffs and I punted the ball. It was just every sport that I got into, I didn't ask to be great at them. I was just exceptional compared to my peers. And that came with a lot of expectation from the coaches of needing me to be great. Mm. And all I wanted to do was have fun. Yeah. And sometimes fun was not having to freaking do what LeBron James has done for 20 years. Yeah. You know, I hear that loud and clear. You know, I'm reflecting on my own life as you're speaking and, and I love my parents dearly. They're the best. They really are. They did get divorced when I was young, so I didn't have the perfect childhood. But one thing I, I do realize is I was not, me and my brother were given that freedom. Basically, there was never uh, anyone telling us, you got to go to college. You got to do this. You got to do that. They just sort of let us do, you know, within reason what we wanted. I now look back on that as probably a gift because I am a, I'm a tattoo artist. I'm kind of got a rebellious spirit. If somebody had put that level of expectations on me, mm, I wouldn't have went well. Like sure. I would have, uh, who knows, maybe you're, I would have walk, walked your path perhaps yeah. because yeah. at that point you're letting everybody down, you know, because they're all telling you, hey, look how good you are at academics. You're going to Harvard, kid. Well, just because I'm good at school doesn't mean I even want to go to Harvard. But right. that's the expectation. So then every time you divert from it, maybe I wanted to go ride my skateboard. I don't want to go to Harvard. I want to do whatever. Every time you do the thing you actually love, be a child, play, 
you're letting them down, you're failing. And and what they see in you and what you feel inside are in conflict. Yep. I get all that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And that makes the struggle worse. Once you're in conflict with the external world and the internal world, mm -hmm. it's very hard to find center or what our true north is, right? You think about what you write down, your mission, vision, and values for who you are. That's your north. But when you're in conflict in the external world and the internal world, it's very hard to decide what your mission, vision, and values are for yourself and where true north is. You're constantly living in this world of trying to meet expectations for others whom you probably love or care about, but also you have this internal mechanism that's saying, I'm supposed to quit this job. Mm. I'm not supposed to go to college. I'm supposed to start this side business or become a tattoo artist because even though I'm really good at mathematics and engineering, the creative side of my person really loves this idea of tattooing and it should be something that I can support my life on, but you don't want to disappoint the people that want you to use your engineering gift and mathematics mm -hmm. to go get a higher education, maybe work for Google or something. But mm -hmm. inside you, you know that that will never make you happy. Mm -hmm. So how do you get the courage to quit? You know, it's funny enough. Being a punk rock kid was not a good thing. You know, going to school with a mohawk and all this shit, you know, you were looked at by the world. But in in some, I'm thinking about this out loud, but in some weird way, I it was probably late junior high, freshman year of high school, punk rock gave me that power. Basically, it taught me, well, anarchy was the big theme, right? It's like, yeah. and I, I, I really liked it. It was just like, fuck everybody, fuck the parents, fuck the schools, fuck them all. I'm going to do whatever the hell I want. And I anchored into that music and that scene and got the hair and the clothes is this like the bad religion gutter mouth days? Yeah, and... yeah. Well, you <laughs> exploited and all the G, uh, GBH, Great Britain hardcore, you yeah. know, the, all the stuff coming out of Europe. And in a weird way, it it was perfect because I think if I hadn't found that punk rock scene, I would have stayed in that mindset of what people wanted out of me. And yeah, going and telling my family, I'm not going to college, I'm going to go be a tattoo artist would have been a hard thing to say. But yeah. when that day came for me, I had no problem saying it. I was... You know, when they laughed at me and told me that was crazy and good luck, you know, you'll be broke your whole life. I was like, <laughs> I didn't care. Yeah. You know, well, and um, yeah, just kind of kind of strange how that punk rock thing was, gave me this, I guess, confidence. It's the, individual, it's the individuality, right? Like, right. I, so I, I wrote in my book why basketball and skateboarding are my two favorite sports in the world. And basketball and skateboarding have this intertwining culture of individualism especially when it comes to fashion, right? Like when I was in fourth grade, you know, I'm like, this is 1990-ish. And this is like the punk rock era that you're probably talking about. Well, I'm a young kid at this time. If you're an old school skateboarder, you know, when I was a kid, you had 411 video magazine. Like mm. people don't even remember the California Skate Express mm. days when you got this catalog every quarter mm. that had all the new skate decks, that. all the new shoes. Yeah. And your 411 video magazine came in the mail and you put the cassette in there and you saw people on there, the Papas brothers and Tom Penny and mm. his big skate pants. Mm -hmm. And it was, they represented themselves. Yeah as a brand before social media and Rob Deerdeck really created this idea that you as a person are the brand mm. that sells products mm. and have value based on your gifts and who you are as a person. And then basketball, at this time, we have Allen Iverson coming into the league. Dennis Rodman is painting his hair with cheetahs on it, right? Mm. And these outlandish looks that make people individuals. Mm. I loved the idea that I'm gonna express myself how I feel like I wanna express myself. And whether or not you like that, that's on you mm. because whatever it is that I decide that I'm going to do, my self-expression will not be overshadowed by how good I am at what I'm doing. Mm. They're going to work together in this unison and you're going to remember me because of my expression and how well I am, how good I am at doing what I do. And skateboarding and, and basketball were the two places for me that you could see that individualism. Punk rock, same thing, right? Mm. We're gonna have our hair, wear these clothes. Back then it was the big long chain wallets that went down yeah, to your yeah. knees and the and 25 the 25 bracelets, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, and that was against the grain. Yeah. But at some point shortly after that, we started to realize that the against the grain was actually a culture that was going to explode and create a niche for people to feel like, yeah, it's okay to be like this. We're not any different than anybody else. This is just how we express ourselves. Absolutely right about all that. But I'm thinking about you. So it's 
you do find it. You, you in high school, you are a dominant BMXer. Yes, you're climbing that. You're on the cover of what, Matt? What was BMX or BMX or racing magazine, which at the time was the largest BMX racing magazine. And in the you're world. 17 when that came out. 17. So you're a superstar, and you're in an alternative. BMX, hmm, that's a good, I, I rode BMX, by the way, too, when I was a yep. kid. My dad got me a PK Ripper, the yep. sickest bike ever, yep. and took it down and got my ass kicked every weekend. It was like, <laughs> I went like five races before I realized, I'm just not going to be good at this. It wasn't, yeah. it wasn't like you. Yeah. But I love B, uh, BMX, and BMX, sort of like skateboarding, it wasn't a team sport. It right. was an individual sport, which I always love those types of sports. I would never, I never did. Even when I did team sports, I wrestled because it was just me. Mm -hmm. But you, you were killing it. Yep. And, and so you're killing it. Plus you're in a sport where you can be an individual, but still that wasn't enough for you. No. Something was still grinding you. Yeah. All the stuff that was missing at 12 was missing more when I was 18 mm -hmm. and 17, when I was right. on the cover of that magazine about to turn 18. The only thing that was keeping me upright was the helmet being on. Mm -hmm. So it was like my escape from the internal struggle was what I was doing, but I didn't even want to do what I was doing. Mm. which is such a weird complex. But until you get around some world-class athletes, you know, that have been drafted into the NFL and the NBA who have make millions of dollars and will look you straight in their face and say, I don't even like fucking playing this. The only reason I do it is because I'm good at it. But on the inside, I feel like I'm broken. On the inside, I'm struggling mm. with alcoholism and drug addiction, but everybody else is going, what's there to be sad about? You make millions of dollars. Right. Well, just like people that sit down at a corporate desk that don't want to be sitting down at a corporate right. desk, there are athletes that are on the field that don't want to be on the field. They just don't know mm. anything else. And they're so exceptional at being an athlete. Mm. That's where they've earned their right to make money. Just tons of it, right? Is at 18, I'm not making money. I'm very successful at BMX. It's a niche sport that doesn't pay a lot, but I'm miserable on mm. the inside which is why the escape towards drugs was about to follow was I wasn't using proper coping skills to deal with myself. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that was, you know, therapy wasn't acceptable at that time. Mm -hmm. There wasn't a lot of therapists at that time. Friends or men didn't know how to come together as men and sharpen each other through vulnerable conversation to say, look, even though we're men, we still have these struggles internally mm -hmm. and we have to talk about these struggles. And then, with that, I would find reason or purpose in the platform I had on a BMX bike, which would be totally different, right? It wasn't about racing and winning. Obviously, I want to race and win, but what can I do with the stage of racing and winning and competing at a high level in which I can help others mm -hmm. achieve something within themselves or have inspiration that they too can race BMX and be successful? And so because I didn't have those pieces, I was going to have to try and find something that could give me that sense of purpose, that sense of contentness or happiness, which is what I thought I was trying to achieve. And that's when substance use experiment had started. It makes total sense. And you know, it's funny, you, you just said something I never even thought about. And you see all these professional athletes, I, I, until right now, I assume they all absolutely fucking loved it. But you're right, there's gotta be plenty out there who don't even wanna be out there. They wanna be a, a rapper or, a, or an artist or who knows what they wanna Some be. Some of them wanna be business owners. Right. And they're out there and they're stuck in this deal. And and yeah, you see it at the highest levels, right? You've got guys that are making millions and millions of dollars and they crash on drugs and alcohol or whatever yeah. they do. Or go broke. Or go broke, yeah. You know, the girl I coached at the Olympics in 2016, Brooke Crane, for the last four years, it was miserable for her. Mm. She didn't even want to do it. Really? You know, and uh. she teetered retirement for four years. Mm. She had to get so miserable mm. that she finally made the decision. Why couldn't she stop? She was making good money. Right. In, in the fame and the accolades and, and yeah the, and, and it's all you know around what you. yeah that's and, hard to get out of us you got all these people yeah. you have to break up your whole paradigm sure you have to break up your identity sure that's for most your people, identity yeah for athletes that's uh, a big struggle. what are you if you're not that anymore you're nothing that's right <laughs> like the rest of us yeah because at the end yeah. of the day nobody is anything we're right. all human beings 100 percent yeah, I never, I never considered that, uh, but it makes total sense. You know, I just assumed everybody that hated their jobs worked at Geico Insurance. Yeah, and wish they could be an athlete that made thirty million. A year. Right, <laughs> but you got the you got the athlete wishing he could be uh, the owner of a insurance company. Maybe I don't. Yeah, know. we or, don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very cool. Well, not cool. It's just interesting. Inter yeah, yeah interesting. it's very inter interesting. And so, yeah, I mean, like a lot of people do in this world, we self medicate. 
right? You got these problems and the doctors aren't giving you the right stuff and the therapists aren't there and we f- we'll find a way to, 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 on our own to deal with this. And you know, your story is interesting too. And it's probably, it's pretty obvious now, but the opioid epidemic, which I think was, um, God, I never watched this documentary. Maybe you've seen it. It's about the big pharma company that really pushed Vicodin, I believe. They had to pay some- Oxycontin. Oxycontin and Vicodin. And they had to pay the government something like- Six billion. Six billion, but they made- Oh, billions more. And on the interest on their bank accounts are gonna far exceed the billions they have to make in payments. You're talking about the Sackler family. Oh, that's, yeah, that's yeah. the one. So this is the, my run with opioids. 18, cover the magazine. Graduate high school, moved down here to be a network administrator for a guy who was Entrepreneur of the Year in California, ended up being a Ponzi scheme guy. So six months later, I'm back in Fresno, California, six hours north of here, mm. and I get introduced to a drug called Oxycontin. Mm-hmm. And this was in 2002. And it was right at the beginning. This drug had been out now for three years. So it was brand new to the market. Nobody knew anything about it, especially these suburban white kids that went through a D.A.R.E. program that said, stay away from LSD. PCP, crack cocaine, methamphetamine, heroin, drugs that you couldn't even find in our neighborhoods. Mm. Didn't even know anybody that used those drugs or had a parent hooked on them. Mm. So when we get pushed over and it's an orange bottle, Mm -hmm. we think comes from a doctor. Yeah. Let's try it. Mm. Oh, that, that feels great. How are you going to get addicted on something came from a doctor? Let's do it. Next thing you know, the only difference between that orange bottle and the cellophane that covered the black tar heroin that came from Mexico wrapped in foil was the package. Molecularly identical? What I mean is when I cook up heroin and I shoot it up, right? and I cook up Oxycontin and I shoot it up, the only difference between the two fucking drugs are the difference that runs across the back of my tongue as it's circulating through my veins. That's it. Hmm. They both achieve the exact same thing. Hmm. They're probably one molecule different just for legal purposes. But, yeah, well, um, but yeah. it, the package, right? right, you, right it right. comes in this package and everybody in Western society says that package is made to fix you, mm-hmm. to help you, not destroy you, not make you do things that you said you would never do, not make you just completely set aside your mission, mission, mission vision, and values as a human being. But that orange bottle can do exactly the same thing as methamphetamine if you're using Adderall. It can do the same thing as uh, heroin or fentanyl if you're using Percocet, Oxycontin, Vicodin, Hydrocodine, MS cotton, morphine pills. Mm. They all have a very similar molecular structure, which means they all trigger the brain and the the reward system in the same way that a street narcotic would. Mm. And so they have the same dangers. But when I was 18, I didn't think that. No. Why would you? How could you? Yeah, that's it's shocking that none of those people are in prison. You know, not they, to me. Once you, I mean, at this point, we've learned there are people that have so much money, nothing will ever happen to them. Hmm. Nothing. They will buy their way out of everything. Yeah. Well, I got to be careful here, but <laughs> you know, the cancel culture is real. You know. Yeah. But uh, you know, these are the same folks that uh, helped us out with the old uh, vaccines. And, yeah. The jab. You know, the, it just, it just, yeah. I yeah. Mean, the trust that was suddenly given to them suddenly after what happened through the, uh, that, the epidemic um, was shocking to me. It, you know, you had all these people that were anti-pharma and then suddenly they were our sa- savior, saviors, yeah. you know. An interesting complex. Yeah. That's a good, pro- uh, well, they had a hell of a propaganda campaign, that's for sure. Yeah. They, they did a good job on that one. Yeah, that was, that was, I was just talking to a friend about that. Yeah. But you know, my life went from trying Oxycontin and feeling the best I'd ever felt in my life. I thought I had the answer. I thought I found what you were looking for, the red, the, the, the magic pill, mm-hmm. the substance that could fix things with a moment's notice. And Oxycontin did that to me for the first time. And so I started using that drug with this idea that I'm just using it so I can participate in life like you get to. Because mm. I just want to be like you, just like I did with my teammates when I was younger, right? Within three years, I was inside a house that belonged to my friend and uh, robbing his mother at gunpoint in a home invasion robbery for her Oxycontins that were inside the house. It had completely taken me from a person who knew right from wrong and could make the right decision more often than not to a person who no longer cared about what was right and what was wrong. The only thing I cared about was not being dope sick. And the idea that while I was under this substance was the only moments in my life that I got to feel any type of peace, contentment, and fulfillment 
And because of that, when I didn't have it, the things I would be willing to do to get it would be an extreme action like committing the home invasion robbery. Which led you to, to go into to prison. Yeah. Which I know you'll agree was the greatest day of your life. Yeah, it was. <laughs> and it, but I, you know, my suffering had to continue for about two years and I ended up homeless for six months at the very end. And that was, you know, as, as much as it's created, you know, lifelong traumas from different experiences I had as a homeless person, it was that pain is what has gotten me to where I'm at today. Mm -hmm. It was a pain that was so bad. And I questioned whether it would ever stop that when I felt freedom from the addiction, the pain has served as a reminder of a place I never want to go to again. Mm -hmm. It's served as the hot stove of how I'm going to navigate my feelings because the addiction was such a hot stove. It felt like it had melted every facet of my body, including my mind, body, and spirit all at once that I would never put my hand on that stove again because of how demoralizing it was and how low it took me to a place that I never intended to go to. And so when I got to prison and I felt like I had this opportunity to rebuild my life, it really has served since I made that decision at Wasco State Prison that this is gonna be the last time I ever come to this place. It's gonna be the last time I ever use a substance. And moving forward, I'm gonna focus on the things that make me feel good and the things that um, really lift me up as a person so I can be an effective leader for others. Yeah, that's the beauty. Uh, there, there's a gift in pain. You know, the universe seems to be built in a very specific way. I'm not a Christian. Uh, I think you are, yeah. right? But I am a spiritual man. And I, I kind of look at the, the the whole thing like a big machine. I, I'm a very practical. I grew up in Iowa. I grew up with farmers and construction <laughs> workers. So I'm <laughs> like- Middle of America. Yeah, and I'm just- I like practicality and, yeah. and, and in a practical way as a 52 year old man, I, I would take God out of it, take um, spirit angels and everything away. There just seems to be, I can see it now after this many years, there's a system at play here and you either play by the universal laws that were laid into the system. And if you do not, pain will be applied. At first, it's probably not too much. And that pain will increase until you figure out how to play this game correctly. And, and, you know, from a Christian standpoint, that would be the, uh, the love of, of God, right? I mean, just like a parent, you can't let your kid do things that can hurt them. So you have to apply repercussions. At first, the repercussions are gentle. The kid keeps doing it. They get worse, right? And, and, and that's what's happening here. So, so yeah, pain's a, a gift, you know, for those of us that uh, make the change. Some yeah. people don't. They take that all the way to the bitter end. But in your case, that pain was what you needed? Yeah. And, and you got the message finally. It took yeah. you a minute. It did. I had a, a spiritual awakening January 21st, 2007. And that was really where the perspective shift changed. That's when I became a Christian, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Although I reluctantly say that I'm a Christian mm -hmm. just because of my own studies and not being raised in a church. Um, I really do have a lot of frustrations with um, the church as a, uh, as a mindset mm -hmm. and the typical Christian and what that means. And, you know, every time I see somebody spewing a bunch of hateful stuff and I look at their bio on Instagram, they have some Bible verse or they talk about how they're a Jesus lover and, and nothing I read in the book had Jesus calling people names and saying hateful stuff or being judgmental towards people's situations. It was really centered. It was centered around love. And so I prefer to say that I'm a spiritual man, okay. guided by the principles of Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. not by the church. Yeah. Um, my fellowship is with anybody who um, wants more in life, who just loves people for who they are and accepts people's decisions as maybe not being uh, the best outcome in a situation, but understanding why somebody would make a decision they did that they felt was best for them in that moment. And how do we love and care for that person so they know that, hey, maybe you didn't think that this decision was the best, but it was the best one in the moment for you. And, and that if you're feeling something or some type of way, we still have your back mm. and we love you through that. And we want you to know that you can be open with us about that because I, pushing people away and casting people away because of their beliefs and thoughts is just the opposite of what I want. Mm. But that day I surrendered, the next day I was arrested. And when I got to jail, it gave me enough of a perspective shift that I knew I was gonna take a different direction and follow a different lead because ultimately on January 21st, I realized you're going against a universal grain. Mm. If you continue, you will die. Mm. In my situation, I will die. It's not about hell. 
It's about, I will not survive. And there was a part of me, as much as I hated myself, that still wanted to be alive. Yeah, that bumper sticker. Jesus, save us from your followers. <laughs> yeah, no, it's true. It really is. Well, you can't judge something um, uh, by the by the people operating the you know inside the church. You got you got shitheads and you got shitheads in every everywhere you go. Everywhere. AA meetings, NA meetings, yeah. tattoo shops, yeah. grocery stores. Yeah, shitheads are shitheads. Yep, and they're in churches and they're er everywhere. Yeah, they're everywhere. But I like the way you put that. Yeah, you're you're you definitely. Uh, we have the same beliefs. Right? Yeah, I, I'm more maybe Buddhist, but um, and and some other things. And but that's cool. That's cool. So the, this awakening moment was it? What I mean, it was just a, everything built up to that moment. What was that like? Was it like a voice from the fucking heavens shot into you kind of vibe? Or what? I, well, I mean, and, and I'm a, I want I want to condense my spiritual awakening story just for the sake of time, so we can talk about other aspects of you know my life, but. I had a phone call in 2005 from a friend who said that God gave him a vision and that I was in this vision and I was going to get three significant chances. If I didn't mm. stop doing what I was doing before these chances took place, he saw in this vision that I was going to go to prison. A year later, I get pulled over three times in four days. I'm pulled out of the car because I'm on felony probation two of the three times. Should have been arrested each time. The third time I was pulled over in a car with fake tags, they were construction paper, and where I'm in California at this time. Uh, no license, car hadn't been registered in five years. I have drugs in my pocket, needles in the backpack, and she has drugs on her. We get pulled over in Sin City, which is right by the college, Fresno State, which is a tough area. It's got college students, but it's also got bulldog gang members and a lot of drugs and prostitution. And the cop that pulled us over had just pulled the tags off the car as she was walking up. And she's like waving this little piece of construction paper and she says you know the tags are fake on this car and we didn't we borrowed the car from a drug dealer she doesn't ask if anybody's on parole or probation she goes back to the car after listening to our sob story that we were christmas shopping because it was november of 2006 and she comes back with a fix-it ticket <laughs> tells us to take the car back to the person we borrowed it from this thing had been registered in five years bro there was no insurance she didn't have a license and uh, I remember when the cop went back to the car, I was like, I think that was the three chances that Adam was talking about. Oh. And she goes, what do you mean? And I was like, he called me a year ago and said that God was going to give me three significant chances. If I didn't stop doing what I was doing before these chances took place, I was going to go to prison. I was like, I think I'm going to go to prison soon. That was November of 2006, January 21st, two months later, I was invited to a church by a drug dealer I was buying dope from. Turns out he was a minister in this church. He invites me to this Jesus. church, which is crazy, right? Yeah, it's crazy, yeah. But it, to me, crazier is a flaming bush that talks to a guy, Moses. Right. And so I tell people, God is using all things around us to reach out to us, to get us to see that he does exist and that he truly is built on this overflowing mercy and grace and forgiveness, despite all the bad things that are happening in this world. He is in control, and at the end, things are all going to be okay. I submit my life that day, and it was, I'm grateful to him because I would not have gone to church under any other circumstances. He was a black man from the projects of West Fresno who did not represent the rich white culture of church that I believed existed in the world only for money that I was raised around. Mm -hmm. All of my friends that went to church, it was just to me a fear mechanism. Mm -hmm. And the churches just wanted to raise money and take the money out of the pockets of these upper middle class or upper class white people, right? To then pocket themselves. Well, when I was invited by this person, it was like, well, what's his motive? What do, how do I benefit him? I'm homeless. Mm -hmm. I've got size 12 shack shoes on. I weigh... 138 pounds. I'm a size nine shoe and the 34 LRG jeans, I'm 138 pounds. They're, and the jacket, the Dickies jacket is filled with blood stains. What benefit do I have for this man inviting me to church? None. So I go and the pastor lays his hands on me and says that God has favored me in my entire life and everything that I've done. And I started crying and he said, you don't have to worry anymore. He's going to remove you from your addiction. And I remember thinking to myself, a miracle was about to happen. I thought the miracle at that time was that I wasn't going to be uh, withdrawing from opioids because mm -hmm. that's really what I needed was some way to stop the suffering of how these withdrawals came into my life and were so painful I couldn't get clean and sober. That's not how the miracle worked. Mm -hmm. I was shooting dope two hours later in a Toyota pickup, but that night is the night I broke into the house that I was arrested in on January 22nd. Mm -hmm. 
which is ultimately what sent me off to prison 30 days later on a, a probation violation for the armed robbery that I committed in 2004. That's beautiful. And um, yeah, people talk about do miracles exist? I mean, to me, that's a miracle. And that's proof that there is uh, somebody up there looking after us. It's just too coincidental. To have a friend tell you, you're gonna get three chances. You got the three chances, you didn't change your ways, and yep. then you got the reward, which yep. was- I have my affirming, things that have happened, right? It can't, it's too good to be coincidental. Right, right. There's too many coincidences in my story for it to be a coincidence right. because that time that I was in Wasco State Prison and I started praying and meditating and reading this book and spending time with myself for the first time in my life because I was in a lockdown cell, cell block for 23 and a half hours a day. So I had plenty of time to think. Mm. I feel God call me to four things. Get on your bike, race professionally, I need you to go to the Olympics. I need you to start a nonprofit organization for kids. And I need you to become a professional speaker. From that moment to the moment that you're in right now as listeners, all of that's happened. Mm. All of it. Mm. Became a professional athlete, coached at the Olympics, started a nonprofit for kids. One of the biggest motivational speakers in the world right now with the only story that exists. Nobody else has been to prison and participated in the Olympics, mm. whether they were a coach or an athlete. How many things do I have to line up <laughs> yeah. for somebody to say, maybe there is something there. <laughs> yeah. Now the, the, the opposer would say, you just were able to manifest it through your thoughts. Okay, I'll let you have that. But to me, there's no way. Because if you knew me when I was on the street shooting gutter water and heroin, if you knew me when I was sitting down next to Bulldog gang members and they were watching me mix methamphetamine and Oxycontins together to shoot up, while they watched me, scared the hell out of them because they'd never seen somebody put so much dope in a needle at one time and me look them in the eyes and say, just throw me in the dumpster if I die. You don't think I'm going to be able to think my way out of this situation because if I could have thought myself out of that situation, I wouldn't even have made it to that moment to begin with because after six months of using fucking dope, I was done. I just didn't know how to stop. Mm. It was the surrender to a power greater than myself that unleashed the potential of what I was gonna be able to accomplish, not according to my own will, but according to a will of something greater than me that said, this is what I have built for you. This is the pathway I have laid out for you. Do you wanna take it or do you not? Mm. Because you know what's gonna happen if you don't. And I said, you know what? Your way's gotta be better than mine because my way was death. Mm. And since I surrendered to that and followed that, that's why I'm here today. It's a killer, man. It's a beautiful story. It really, really is. And uh, there's many like it, I mean, different, like you said, sure. from prison to the coaching the Olympic BMX team, no one's done that, and many of the other things you've done. But there are a lot of stories that, that, that line up just that way. A message comes to people from a friend um, or, or sometimes just a burst bursts out of their own mind from some unknown location. Yep. And you're told very clearly what you got to do. Yeah. And you do it or not. And I don't push that on anybody. Yeah. It's not a sermon. Yeah. This is my experience. It's just, yes. just consider my experiences. Yeah. Wow, that was pretty interesting. Yeah. It's not, I don't need anybody to take on my faith because yeah. I didn't want that from anybody else for me. Mm -mm. You know, you have to do this. No, you don't have to do anything. Do what you feel is best for you. And I truly believe along the way, the tools and the things that you need will show up for you at, at, at that time. And I'll know when we're on the same path. And whether or not I love you either way. Yeah, that's great, man. That's that's fucking great. So, so let's get a little bit into the the prison experience. Yeah. You know, I've never been to prison and I know you've got stories. I mean, what we'll get to it, but I mean, yeah. you're covered in tattoos. All yeah. gotten in prison. Yes. So there's that aspect, but yeah, just whatever else you want to talk about. What was life in prison like? How many years were you in prison? Two years. Only two years? Only two years. What were you sentenced for? Four and a half for armed robbery. Okay. So. I was supposed to actually do four and a quarter. Mm -hmm. There was a mistake on my paperwork that I found out years after I got out, about four years after I got out. And uh, I was supposed to do four and a quarter, but I did just under two years, 23 and a half months. Another perhaps miracle. I mean, you had changed your way in your heart, right? Yep. And then a mistake on your pa paperwork gets you out earlier. Who yeah. knows? Who knows? If the, With what? this calling to go do these things. <laughs> right, right. And I was started it's like working God on was him. saying, get him going. Let's get him yeah. out of here sooner. He's, yeah. he's done enough time. Let's go. Yeah. And I hate parts of that, right? Because somebody's like, well, why would God do that for you and not everybody else? Well, I can assure you because I did two years that I only met two people that I was in prison with 
and every yard that I was on that were actually changing. Everybody else was shooting dope, doing gang stuff, watching TV all day long, gambling all day long, and finding ways to pass time. Mm -hmm. I wasn't finding ways to pass time. I was finding ways to use the time that I had to sharpen the skills that I was given that I didn't ask for. So when I got out, I could carry out the message that was given to me and the mission that I was called to. I didn't meet many people when I was in prison because most people in prison are coming in from environments with belief systems and behaviors that are very self-limiting. And not only are they self-limiting to themselves, what they want is others to be in the same company as them, in the same situation as them. And so they don't want to see people climbing out of the bucket, so to speak, if you've ever heard of the crabs in the bucket effect. I have. They want to use this very odd thinking style in prison. I had a guy one time, because I was starting to get in a bunch of fights when I got to the main line at Tatchby State Prison. Uh, I was on uh, yard two before they flipped it to a PC yard and I was switched to Avenal State Prison to finish out my term. And I had been in three fights within the first four weeks and a guy takes me out to, to, to walk the track. He was from Fontana. And he says, you know, Hoff, we can both look up in the sky right now and we can agree it's blue. And he goes, but in here, it's red. And he goes, and right now you're trying to convince everybody what we already know. It's blue. And he goes, but that's going to get you killed. And he was like, so I'm walking you around the track right now to help you see the sky's red. Just tell everybody it's red. You get what I'm saying? Kind of. No, mean, no. And that's what he said to me. Oh, do you said, get what you, I'm okay, saying? Okay. Right. And I'm like, got it. Mm. I was moved out of the dorm that I was in at shortly after that and switched to the gym. They put me right in front of the cops office because I was becoming such a problem right away. But that's what prison's like. When you get there, you don't get to create your own rules. You don't get to fly by the seat of your own pants. There are people that are in there that come from areas and with experiences that many people don't understand. And those belief systems are the people or the things that run the way or, or, or d design the way prison is run for the inmates. The cops don't do that. Mm -hmm. These other inmates do. And when somebody like me comes in with this strong individualism mm -hmm. of I'll fight for what's right, they will show you that you don't get to win mm -hmm. in that situation. Mm -hmm. And so there was a part of me that had to concede to the leadership of prison, but it also was what saved my life mm -hmm. because I didn't want to be a part of the prison politics. I didn't want to live in prison for the rest of my life and do 15 terms and have an F number, an A number, a Z number, mm -hmm. and be able to go in there and tell these youngsters I've been doing time for 20 years, you know, mm -hmm. I'm the badass on this yard. I wanted to figure out how to get in there, get out and change my life uh, in ways that I would never go back. So you had to play the game a little bit. You had to, or at least um, not be telling everybody around you, I'm not about what you're about. I'm about something totally different. I'm better than you. Yeah. I'm going to go places. You had to kind of keep that to yourself. To some degree. Yeah. I mean, I was very vocal about the Olympic thing and what I was doing, but I think what it allowed me to do was, but the fight started because I was cooking wine. My parents weren't in my life. One of my cellmates at Wasco State Prison said, you need to cook, cook wine or make pruno and that uh, you could get $50 a quart, so you could get about uh, $200 off of a gallon of uh, wine, which would allow me to buy food and support myself because the state's only gonna feed you small meals. You're gonna be hungry most of the day. And I didn't wanna be hungry. And so I had taken on this idea that I would be a winemaker, the same skill set that Rai Rai had. And when I got there, it caused a lot of problems. And so I realized, you know what? And they don't want you to wear sandals to the shower. Because if something happens and there's a fight, you, you're going to slip and fall with these shower shoes on because they don't have any grip. Well, I probably should just follow that rule, even if I believe I can beat everybody up because by me wearing sandals and nobody else doing it, I'm the zebra with a bunch of horses. <laughs> you can't help but see the one thing that looks different. And so that was really what tightening it up for me was not challenging these guys on whether or not you needed to actually follow these rules because the rules didn't make any sense. I'll just say the sky's red. And while I, this, I can tell you that the sky is red, I'm also going to start training for the Olympics, running laps, getting physically fit, spiritually uh, uh, strengthening myself to have this relationship with a power greater than myself who was ultimately going to give me the strength to give up all of these things and focus only on these things that I was called to. And so I had to bump my head into the wall several times 
before I actually conceded and said, you know what, this isn't going to work for me and I can see that and I'm going to do what I wouldn't have done years ago and I'm just going to toe the line to the degree that it just gets you to leave me alone. Makes sense. I would expect you to say that. And that's why I asked the question. You know, I was thinking of you in there, um, not from the background a lot of these people are from, with goals that a lot of these people don't have mm -hmm. and how you would find a way to fit into that system for survival sure. to get where you needed to go. So yep. you had to play the game to some degree, probably yep. just the bare minimum, just enough to, yeah. you know. Yeah. And I put my, like I say, I put my hands up and that helped create a lot of distance too, because I knocked a few heads in those fights. Mm -hmm. And uh, that built the reputation that he would put his hands up. But not only would he put his hands up, the black people in there called me Little Mac from Mike Tyson's punch out. <laughs> and another uh, group of blacks called me Lionheart because I wouldn't back down from my own people trying to uh, get me to concede to this idea. And so when I conceded prior to that, I had put my hands up, defended myself, not because I'm some badass, just because I've defended myself and my athleticism showed up in these fights mm -hmm. that most people, especially in there, didn't have. Mm -hmm. And so then there was a fear that came with or a respect that came with he'll stand up for himself. So long as he's just doing his right, his own thing, just leave the guy alone. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's crazy, man. I, I, yeah. I, that would be a, wouldn't want to find myself in that position. I hope I would do what you did, you know, who knows until you're in it. You Humans know. survive, man. We're, we're so yeah. adaptable. We evolve and adapt and, and, and you do what you need to do to survive environments. That's what makes us special as, as a species. True that. Well, so now you're in there, you've developed your, your way of being there. You've got this um, routine. Mm -hmm. No one's fucking with you anymore. You can go about your day and however you want to do it, which is a lot of fitness, spiritual work, spiritual work, and just focusing intention on your goals. What you're right. going to do when you get out of there. That's right. What a great time, right? I mean, it's really hard, like for people that want to train to do the things you wanted to do. We got, all got to go to work every day. You didn't have, to, you know what I mean? You got the time. No, this is real. That What you're saying is a real understanding that I was having cognitively understanding. There was a moment at the Hatchby State Prison, I had did my 100 meter sprint and I would walk the rest of the track. I got to the last turn three, I stopped at the gate, looked out into the hills, and I remember telling myself, I'm in a top secret training grounds right now. <laughs> I don't have any distractions. Yeah, I'm in here every day and I can put all day into the development of this new character I'm trying to become. You've got to go to work. You've got to pay taxes. You've got to feed family. You got to pay rent. You got to feed yourself by buying groceries. You got car payments, gas, mm -hmm. and all of these things that um, life requires of you. But I don't have any of that. And because of that, I believe that those two years gave me some of the best years of my life to develop as a person that the average person doesn't get. Because from the day we come out of the womb, to the moment we step foot on a campus for school, an institution, life is demanding us to take care of things to achieve. Yeah. And achievement can be the biggest problem in a human's life because self-reflection can occur. You never get to know you. You never get to know what you really want. You're constantly living up or trying to fulfill the expectations of society and how it's become designed. Not for me. Mm -hmm. For two years, I really got to hone in on what I wanted, where I was going, how I was going to get there and what that looked like. And that time, I will tell you, is the most valuable time I've ever had in my life. That's cool that you were able to reframe what prison was. I'm in a, I'm in a special elite training center. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yep. in your mind, that's what it was to you. That's and cool. I believed that I was going to be successful because none of my competitors have ever had to sleep a night on the street strung out on drugs. Mm. That in itself was the transfer of power, strength, and discipline, and will that I believed would allow me to catch up and surpass my competitors. Because what was getting me up in the morning and allowing me to train in the heat and the snow and the wind and the hot and the cold was that I'm never going back to that situation because that was a place I wish upon nobody. And if all you're doing is getting up to ride your bicycle, you and I aren't pedaling the bike the same. Mm -hmm. You're pedaling for your fucking life. life. <laughs> Legitimately. Legitimately. Yeah, that, that, that's, that'll make you a champion. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a perfect scenario. What doesn't kill us makes us stronger. Oldest saying in the book, but you're a living example of that. Yeah. What didn't kill you made you much, much, much stronger. Yeah. 
That's beautiful. That's cool. You know, this is Chats and Tats. Yeah. You're on Chats and Tats, my friend. I'm a <laughs> tattoo artist. All of you already know that. You got a lot of tattoos. And I was really curious about this when I when I saw you online. I'm like, oh, he's heavily tattooed. I wonder who does his work. All your work done in, in prison. prison. So you got a lot of work. You were only there two years, so you were pretty steadily collecting. <laughs> yes, yes. How does that go down? Like, I, I don't know much about it. You'd think I would, but I haven't been to prison. But even in my little circle, I've tattooed with guys that have been to prison. I don't know if I have really detailed stories. I just know you got to be sneaky. They make machines out of certain things. They make uh, ink out of ashes. And yeah. It, what, let me, you tell us how it goes down. How do you it's, get these tattoos in prison? So I know I want to get blasted. Like, I don't want to just you get a couple. You know that before you go there? Like no, you... I know that when I get there and I see these guys that are blasted and I'm like, that's what I want. Mm -hmm. I want the stomach rocker. I want the chest plate a certain way. And I want this whole fucking thing to be a giant scene on my body. And I'm going to define what I want that scene to be, which is a bunch of spiritual work that represents the transformation. And the chest plate is the actual story. So if I break this open, you see the hand with the pills falling in it with the handcuff representing yeah. and the devil that's overlooking the city and street life, the money, the prison, the bars, and then the other side, which is representing the entire spiritual transformation. The, the middle hands, yeah. is the good and the bad deciding to make the decision whether or not I was going to rob somebody. Mm. So this chest plate tells the story that I lived and then everything else was the spiritual transformation that would then control my life. What I needed was somebody that could do that. Mm. What I knew at this time in the mount that I was down was that Mexicans loved realism work. Mm. They didn't typically do what was over here, which was my only non-prison work, which mm. was the white boys loved skulls and like kind of the evil stuff. And I didn't want that. And the way they did it wasn't the way that I really liked art. And so I started looking around, knowing that I was going to be looking for a Southern Hispanic gang member, because that's who the whites could intermix with, mm. uh, that did realism work. And so when I was there, there was a bus that came from Ironwood. And there was a couple guys from Ironwood who had these tattoos on them that were still to this day some of the best work I've ever seen, mm. portrait-wise. And then this one guy had this scene on the back of his his back. And, and I've learned how much I, and I'll tell you the story of how Smokey ruined his work because I thought that we needed to have lines because there were no lines, but this artist didn't use lines. Everything was shading. So there was no hard lines and the depth of the realism of this work came from darkening certain spots of shading and then doing certain pieces. So it looked like some pieces were in the front, some pieces were in the back, but had this huge locomotive train that looked like it was coming out of his back. And he had these four banditos that were riding on these horses and it just looked so real. I was like, yo, who did that? Mm -hmm. And this guy said, this dude's smoky. He's a lifer. And I was like, I is he here? And he's like, no, but he's supposed to be on a bus coming soon. And uh, I was like, how, how do I, how do I get in a tattoo with him? He's like, bro, that guy's line is like five years long. And I was like, what? And he goes, dude, everybody knows who this guy is in the, in the system. And he goes, uh, his name was Joker that I was talking to. And he goes, and I said, bro, tell him I'll give him whatever he wants to get in line with this guy. And he goes, all right, I'll talk to him when he, when he gets here. And a couple weeks go by and uh, he starts bugging him, but I'm not getting much traction on it. You know, I'm a white boy. Um, he's a Southern Hispanic gang member. Why does he want a tattoo on me? Eventually I get him to at least talk to me. And he's down at uh, the tables gambling. And I go up to him and I introduce myself and uh, he says, Joker's been telling me all about you. And uh, I said, yeah, bro, I'm, I'm really looking for some work and I love the way you do things. And he looks at me and he goes, I don't tattoo on white boys. And he goes, what do you want? And I was like, I, I want a bunch of angels. And he goes, you want a bunch of angels? And I was like, yeah, man, I like really want to represent this spiritual change. So I have this whole idea about, you know, these angels. And he like, he goes, what do you got up front? I was like, I'll give you a seven inch flat screen TV and like $50 worth of food just to get on your books. And he goes, I'm going to do it. And I was like, are you serious? And he's like, yeah, man, I'm sick of fucking tattooing naked girls on people. And that's all my people want is chicks. Like you get into prison and the Southern Hispanics have got naked chicks and chicks in bikinis all over there. White boys love evil faces. Right. The Mexicans loved this type of stuff, but nothing but naked chicks and chicks in bikinis and bent over and this, that, and the other. And he was like, I've never done this before. And I'm an artist and I like being challenged in art. 
And so I want to do this. And so we connected. Then the big problem came. He only takes heroin as a payment. And I'm like, I'm sober and I'm committed to this sober process, right? Just to have heroin in your hand it, again. It, it, just, it does not sit with me that I'm going to have to pay this guy on heroin. So I go down, I sit with him and I say, bro, like I'm very serious about my sobriety. And I was like, is there any way that you would let me pay you in food? I'll pay you in enough food that you can buy heroin. But me holding on to the heroin is not something that I'm going to be able to do. And he conceded to another thing that he never does. does. And he's like, all right, I'll let you pay me in food. 50, you got to pay me at least $50 a month. Um, I ended up paying him about $350 total for all my work. Mm. And uh, I got on his books. Wednesday was my day. Um, he jumped me in front of a bunch of other people that were already in line. And every Wednesday, I sat down with Smokey for about four to seven or eight hours. And he would work on me. What I found out was his method was actually different than other tattoo artists. Most tattoo artists in there would take apart the CD player motor, just like everybody else. They'd get the crystal big pen, they'd get the guitar string, and they would create the motor and the ink well. And then obviously you'd cut the racquetball or something and you'd put the ink in there and the ink was just um, soot that was captured in a paper grocery bag um, that was nothing more than a mop string that was burning. And then you would take the soot and you'd put it in a, a shampoo bottle that was dandruff shampoo and water, a certain mixture. You got to find a guy that makes the ink that's at least dark enough because a lot of times it's even lighter than mine. And so what makes him interesting is, is that he doesn't use a single guitar string. Somebody had taught him how to weld multiple guitar strings together and he used three. So a lot of his powder shading effect was a lot smoother than we see most prison work, how it looks, most prison work looks like a pixelated photo. Mm -hmm. It's just a dot, 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 right, dot right, everywhere. Right. Where a lot of smoky stuff truly looks yeah. like it's very brushed on and lightly done. And a lot of that came from his method of how he was shading, which was totally different than everybody else shaded, which was like this. Mm -hmm. And he shaded with like this brushing technique. And so cool. Because yeah. I got to sit down with this guy for hours. And you know, as a tattoo artist or any of you guys listening that are tattoo artists, you, sometimes you're therapists, sometimes mm -hmm. you're listening to stories and, yeah. and, and you're really getting to know people when you got to do a lot of work on somebody yeah. and you make a connection mm -hmm. that you couldn't have if you weren't doing tattoos, 100%. right? And there are these authentic connections where you hear people's life experiences. And so I got to learn Smokey's story. And, and who he was from Anaheim. His name was Roger Garcia. He ended up passing away from a heroin overdose, which is why my back isn't finished, but such a rad person mm. and getting to know his story. And, and he was a lifer in prison. He committed murder at 15, never even had a girlfriend. It was gang related. And he talks about being in prison and having a cellmate who uh, was a tattoo artist. And he saw Smokey's ability to draw with a pencil. And I mean, this dude's drawings, bro, I, I, it was like mm. so talented, this young man at drawing, right? It's like when you see a tattoo artist and you see their work and you're like, yo, yeah. something's different up in that person's head because what we're seeing manifested on skin is just fascinating. It's so incredibly good. And this was him with a pencil. And his cellmate says, your, pa your parents are going to, your mom's going to die at some point and your family's going to forget about you in here. And if you don't come up with a hustle, you're not going to be able to feed yourself sufficiently while you're in here. You need to learn how to take that and put it on people's skin. So he shows me this horse that he tattooed on himself, his first tattoo. I promise you, if you saw this tattoo, you would not think the guy that did my work did that. It was so bad. Okay. <laughs> I was like, I think I could do that. But he said the, the challenge was learning how to work around the way skin worked when you were drawing on it because it wasn't like a flat piece of paper. Yeah. And he was like, it took a totally different technique. And the guy that was the best prison uh, tattoo artist on the yard wouldn't teach him, wouldn't show him anything. So when this guy wouldn't help him, he said, I was determined to become the best tattoo artist in the system after that guy decided he wasn't going to help me. So I just started tattooing on myself. That's a, uh, there's a lot to that story that's so fascinating.
First of all, the waiting list in prison is just like in the outside. <laughs> you know, the guy yep. had like a six month waiting list. That's funny. Yep. And yeah, he isn't using what we call mags. I mean, obviously we use mags and they're, you know, all the way up to 25 needles, which gives you the ability to brush in these big powdery fades. And to do that, some guys can actually do that with a single needle. I don't know how, but just more time, I guess. And he did it with three. I'm looking at some of the stuff on your arms and... I would expect that to be a 10, you know, an 11 mag or a 15 mag. And yep. to think he did it with a three needle, probably had him fanned out a little bit and, yep. and was able to do that. Yeah, that's pretty rad, man. And, and, and how do they, like, you're talking about so many hours, like it's not allowed to, right. to tattoo or get tattooed in prison. Yeah. What do they do to you if they catch you? What's They'll the take your shit. It's not a big punishment. It's just, hey, stop doing that. Take your stuff, give you a, a write-up that you can earn your time back. But you have somebody that's actually watching, holding point. Mm -hmm. Somebody will be up on the top bunk and they're watching the guard station. They're watching the doors, the front and back doors, mm -hmm. if a cop's coming through. Because random times the cops come through and they just walk through the bunks. Mm -hmm. And they're just looking. Is people shooting dope? Or is there stuff going on? Is everybody okay? And the point man whether they were white, Mexican, or, you know, black, they had their own calling for somebody walking. The whites would say, walking, walking, walking. And uh, the Mexicans would say, linea, linea, which meant somebody was on the line. So you put everything away real put quick. Put everything away. And you just sit there like nothing's happening. Sit there like nothing's happening. And they would, they would pass by. A lot of times they know something's happening and the cops aren't trying to interrupt your program. Mm. But if you front them off and you're doing it right in front of their face and making them uh, feel like you don't care about the rules, then they'll stop and, and take your stuff. And I had cops take my ink several times because here I came in with only a, a, a half sleeve and all of a sudden during call, they're starting to see me have sleeves. You can't hide that. You can't hide that. <laughs> and so they started hitting my locker knowing that I had the ink. So then I had to have somebody else hold my ink because the ink was expensive. Mm. It was like 25 to $50 a bottle. And so, yeah, that's, that's how it works is you're, you're, you've got a team of people that are trying to look out for people, the guards that are walking to, to keep you from getting in trouble. And, and we never got in trouble while I was, was tattooing. In fact, I was more scared to get tattooed by him because the first time that I got tattooed by him, he fell asleep and dropped the motor. <laughs> I'm like sitting down and he's drawn this, this line. And, and I was telling you earlier, I was fascinated because like 95% of this is freehand. So he would, he would take a red line. But we call them blood lines. Blood no lines. Ink. Yep. No ink. Yeah. And he would look at that and decide whether or not that was the line he wanted to create with the ink. Mm -hmm. And he would adjust off of that stroke that he made based on the no ink line. He would use that kind of as his mm -hmm. stencil. But he was basically, outside of these faces that were actually stenciled out, um, was all basically looking at a picture, deciding the the angles and however you want to call that as an artist and then he would create it off of that well he's making this uh feather this wing and he goes down and then falls asleep and drops the motor and i'm like tapping him on the side <laughs> smoky smoky and he like he's like yeah and i'm like bro you fell asleep i was like are you all right and he's like yeah i'm all right and i'm like well do you want me to just come back later because i'm thinking this guy f messed me up I wouldn't, everybody's got to have a bad tattoo. I say, this guy messed me up. I don't want this guy to just completely mess me up. He grabs my hand like a little child almost because he's so high on heroin. He holds my arm and he pats me on my, my arm and he says, I'm going to make you a believer. <laughs> so let's go. Four to eight hours every day on Wednesday, bro. And uh, he made me a believer. Like so many people when I was in there were like, bro, where did you get your shit on the street when I transferred prisons? And I was like, nah, man, this guy's Smokey from Anaheim. He blasted me out. There's no way that's from in here. And I'm like, yeah, bro, this guy got down. He was so bad, bro. Well, my thing was, Smokey, like the line's not finished. And he's like, it doesn't need to be. And I was like, are you sure? And he's like, if you want the line, I'll put it there. And I'm like, yeah, go do that. So we did a session of him actually lining out these feathers. And then I started to realize when I see, seen these other people who was tattooing on, oops, yeah. I think I just took his style away from him, which was <laughs> no hard lines. 
You were a pain in the ass client. Oh, yeah, yeah. I am at everything, bro. My contractor that built my house hates me. Uh, yeah. I would have told you, no, we're doing it this way. Yeah. And you know what? I would appreciate it, Smokey, to say, listen to me, bro. I'm not doing that. Yeah. No, you know, they're just thinking of Smokey. God rest his soul. But uh, man, what he'd have done out here in our world. I try to tell him. Yeah. He wouldn't announce you his were, game. Well, you were walking the walk, and it's too bad you didn't have a... Uh, who knows what it takes for him to have switched his ways. Obviously, knowing you and hearing your story wasn't enough for yeah. Smokey. The Southern Hispanic gang members have a lot more pressure than I had, right? I wasn't a skinhead. I wasn't involved in gangs. For him to get out of prison, he would have had to debrief. The debrief would have meant he would have had to go to a PC yard. He would have had to denounce his gang, and he would have had to tell on people, which would have put his life at risk. Mm. And he just, he wasn't willing to do that. At least after 15 years of being in prison, he wasn't willing to do that. But I told him, bro, you could make a killing mm. on the street. If you could do this with a guitar string, with the stuff that they have out there, like you could be traveling the world, just going to places yeah. and your books are going to fill up because social media is around yeah. and people are going to want your work and your story is so good. Mm -hmm. It's going to make people want to be a part of like your gift even more. Yeah. But unfortunately, uh, we transferred prisons and he was going to try and change yards to finish my back piece. We were going to do this big mountain scene and Jesus was going to be hanging off this cliff with his shepherd's rod behind him. And there was going to be a lamb that was stuck on this little piece of a, the cliff that was on the cliff. I would have fell off. And the lamb represented me and Jesus reaching down to, to save me. In the mountain scene, there was like an eagle flying through. So we had this whole back scene that he wanted to finish. And so he was going to transfer from yard six to yard five. Mm. And somebody came up to me and said, bro, Smokey died last night. And I was like, what? Are you sure? And they're like, yeah, bro, they did count in the morning and he, he died from heroin overdose. That, that kind of another question I have, you know, it, it makes sense. Yeah. You make your ink, you make the machine. And there's a lot of things you can make from the things that are already in prison. How does heroin or drugs in general get into the prison? How, how do they do that? Heroin's the easy one because it changes shape and it comes through somebody's ass or some girl's vagina. Okay. They so, bring it in through visiting and they pass it off in visiting and then it's, it's just hooped. Okay. From one hoop to the next. I see. And then they bring it on the yard. But, you know, you can get a clavo of heroin is what they call it, the Mexicans, because they were the ones that got it. You know, clavo of heroin like this can get smashed and put in your butt. Well, clavo of heroin the size of a golf ball is probably worth about $15,000. In prison. The, in prison. Because what they would call a 50 sheet is about a $5 paper on, on the street, mm -hmm. which is a very small sliver of heroin. Mm -hmm. That $5 sliver of heroin on the street goes for 50 in prison mm. and you're not allowed to do that alone mm. you have to share it with your people mm -hmm. a minimum of two people and that's not even enough to get one person high so realistically <clears throat> you're buying 50 100 150 dollars 250 dollars worth of dope and everybody's going to share it mm -hmm. so you got to have some hustle on your own to even afford to be a heroin addict I mean, obviously he had his hustle. He was a tattooer, so he had the ability to get as much as he well, wanted. Well, that, that's why he had such a, a hell of an addiction. Because he could get as much he as he could wanted. Get a, he could get as much as he wanted, and the homeboys would break him off. Bro, work on me. I'll, I'll break you off. Because they wanted his work so much. Mm -hmm. But I've seen a lot of people get run out of yards. Come in meth heads, mm -hmm. addicted to meth, and within three weeks, strung out on heroin with a $2,500 bill that they can't pay. And here's the thing I've learned. In prison... They'll front you whatever you want, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, whatever you want, bro. But if you can't pay, coming to get you. Oh. Because that, like I say, that clove of heroin on the street might be $1,000, $500. They're going to turn around and make 15, 20, 30, $40,000 on that clove. So if you don't pay them that three grand, they don't really care. They just kill you or try to. Mm -hmm. And so these guys, you know, within a month, six weeks, they're getting chased off the yard or having to tell, uh, the cops are fight right in front of the cop station. So the cops arrest them right there. Then they go back to the office and tell them I owe $2,500 to the Southern Hispanics. And they're going to kill me if you don't get me out of here. Fucking hardcore, man. <laughs> Fucking hardcore. Yeah. Well, okay. So you get out. Hmm? You go pro. You're winning. Yes. You're winning a lot. You're doing great. Yes. 
You blow your knee out. Yes, 2011, October. What, what happened? I had an ACL replacement too. Put my foot out at 30 miles an hour. This guy, David Herman, who was the top American for the London Games in 2012. We were in Orlando, Florida. We were racing neck and neck. He hits me when he makes a mistake and I put my foot out. Bam, 30 miles an hour. Snapped my ACL, almost shattered my shin, obliterated both of my meniscuses. Mm. I was 28, about to turn 29 in November. And I couldn't recover from it. I was at the age where it was going to be very difficult to recover. I had complications and that was the end of the racing part of my life. Mm. But I got it. I did it. I look back, no regrets. Now, but at that time. Devastation. How yeah. How long, I was just going to ask, like, how long did that depression haunt you? Well, a year and a half. So you went through a rough year and a half of reassimilating. Trying and, to figure out. I was trying to get it to go come back right trying to race then i developed a back problem then i developed ulcerative colitis and it was just like dude this has got to be god saying you're not doing that you're not doing this this way in this way no i'm not going to let you do this Mm -hmm. and i was able to surrender to that and say okay what direction do you need me to go Mm -hmm. i had the nonprofit dream Mm -hmm. right i have the olympic dream still i have the speaking dream Mm -hmm. i have now the ability to put more energy into this started speaking right when i got out of prison but it wasn't what it was about to become and uh, coaching BMX athletes is what I started doing at the tail end of my racing career. Mm-hmm. And the nonprofit was something that I had visioned. And so I put some energy into that. In 2012, I had started becoming a coach that was putting myself out there as a coach, mm-hmm. putting myself out there as a speaker even more, and uh, starting my nonprofit from a very grassroots phase of, like we raised $2,500 our first fundraiser, mm-hmm. and that was amazing. Mm-hmm. By 2016, we were raising over $120,000, you know, giving away $10,000 worth of skateboards at our summer camp, $40,000 worth of BMX bikes at our summer camp, and uh, creating an after-school program that was in Southeast Fresno that was giving an opportunity to kids that, you know, we learned couldn't even take food home without hiding it because there was no food in the house. And that if they didn't hide the food that they got from Meals on Wheels program, that was a government-funded meal program, that their family members would steal it because they too were also starving for food. And uh, we were giving them an environment um, to experience community that was built on this experience of, man, we love you. And we want you to experience what we got to experience as kids, right? Riding bikes. And, you know, he was telling me about riding bikes and motorcycles and skateboards. And, you know, we really wanted kids to experience that, that, you know, we're so stuck in an environment of poverty, which was really just nothing but survival from sun up to sundown mm-hmm. on basic needs, food, water, shelter, mm-hmm. that they didn't know what it was like to have fun and feel like a kid. And we did so great for, you know, seven or uh, five years before my speaking became such a big thing that I had to set away the Free Will Project when the people I hired to run it just weren't able to raise the money that I was able to raise to sustain the program from an administrative place. Well, good on you, dude. I can't even ima- imagine the um, countless lives you changed. You know, the people that are out there today that are living a productive and fruitful life because of your existence. Many of those kids from that after school program, yeah. one of them became a business owner and uh, owns a tow truck company. Mm-hmm. And uh, he messaged me, I don't know, three years ago. And he was like, I just want you to know I'll never forget the program that you had. Mm-hmm. You know, because that's, cool. that, that, that's what we want. We all have that. The three of us in this room, we have that. Many of the listeners right now, you have that. Mm -hmm. These experiences that you could say, you know what, this was a really cool point in my childhood where I was a kid. And we were able to give that to a kid Mm -hmm. where he will never forget it. And and that was the paycheck, right? Mm -hmm. Was that we were able to allow that that kid to be a kid for uh, two hours a day Mm -hmm. uh, at the Free Will Project. Fucking awesome. Yeah. Awesome. So you do go to the Olympics as a coach. As a coach. Made um, it as a coach. Yep. And how, how, how did your um, rider do? She took fourth. We learned a very hard lesson after years of training for one event. And that is we win together and we lose together. Mm. Uh, I told her to pick a lane. If you don't know anything about a BMX race, it's eight lanes. It's like a hundred meter dash. Mm-hmm. Only... When the gate drops in a BMX race, there are no lanes after that. Mm -hmm. You can move wherever you want according to how much space you have. Mm -hmm. The two women that were the top in the world at this time were Mariana Pajon from Colombia and Elise Post from the United States. Very skilled on bikes, but also very powerful women in terms of power and speed. They crashed each other a lot Mm -hmm. over the last four years because they were relentless in their, if I don't win, nobody wins. I'm taking you out. I'm taking you out. So. 
I knew that they wouldn't line up next to each other, lane one and lane two, because they both knew they wanted space to create speed to figure out who could get to the first turn first. That meant that lane two and lane three were open. But if these two were on the outside of two different or on the outside of two different riders, those two riders stood no chance because nobody was powerful enough to race with them. Mm. So as soon as the gate dropped, they would move in. Two girls would be out of the race. Mm -hmm. The girls in lane six, seven, and eight, I believed were there only because there wasn't enough talent yet in the women's class mm. to load eight riders that were freaking badasses. Mm. So I told Brooke, pick one lane outside of Elise. I don't care where she goes. She's not going next to Mariana. She's gonna give herself some space. And the girls on the inside of both of those girls are out of the race as soon as the gate drops. Go one lane outside of her because the girls that are going to be on the outside of you are at the Olympics to say they're there. They're not real contenders. Are, they're not real contenders, which means we're going home with gold, silver, or bronze if you just don't crash. Mm -hmm. Five minutes before the race, she texts Jason Richardson, who was her sports psych and a good friend of mine, Dr. Jason Richardson. And she says, I'm going fucking inside. Dude, I was so frustrated. You want to believe in your athletes, and I did believe in Brooke. But as a coach, we make decisions on what we know. Yeah. And what we believe is the best shot, especially at something like the Olympics, to just come home with some hardware. Because that's what we sacrifice our entire lives as Olympians to do. And historically, she'd never been as powerful as them. Mm -hmm. Could she be? Yes, because we'd seen it. But at the Olympics, it's the, the highest level of sport. So pressure is like you've never felt before, which means mentally it's more in than physically. So for her to get in that gate, it was going to take so many stars of alignment for this to actually work out mm -hmm. in the way that she thought, because she was riding well, but she got cut off as soon as the gate dropped. Mm. She was out of the race because like I said, Mariana and Elise moved in. So she wasn't able to get any kind of speed. The girl that went one, one lane outside of Elise, bronze medal. Mm -hmm. Didn't even get challenged by anybody. She came up at the end of the race and we met at this gate because I wasn't able to go down there. They only allowed one coach and the top girl was the one who got to pick her coach to go down on the track. And she's like, I should have listened. And I was like, you know what, Brooke? Now's not the time. I'm not going to chew into you and you know, tell you you fucked up and you, you need to listen to me because I, I was you know, able to see that we were at the biggest event in our life. And what are the odds of even being here? as a coach and athlete, like less than 1% of humans get to participate in the Olympics. Right. It was just, we'll talk about it later. All right. You know, and then that talk was, you've got to understand, we're going to win together and lose together. And if we aren't willing to do that, we're going to clash on these type of decisions. We have to have a level of trust in that I'm doing what's best for you and you're going to carry that out. And sometimes what I believe is best for you isn't going to be what's best for you. And we're going to come back and say, that didn't work. That's all right, what do we do different next time? But at the biggest race of, in the world, you know, the last Olympic experience you got to have, it wasn't a time to test something out. Yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully that like every, not bad thing, but challenging or disruptive thing that happens in her life taught her some kind of lesson that she is gonna listen on the, some other moment in her life. Oh, yeah. perfect for her in some, some way, yeah. somehow, you know? And her story's great a very powerful story herself and and both of us if she was in here right now she would tell you the olympics don't mean shit even if she got a medal mm. it wouldn't mean shit because what she was looking for was freedom from her own struggles internally and uh through my relationship with her and the encouragement of the loved ones around her she was able to find that strength and purpose and fulfillment that she was looking for and uh, the achievements weren't going to do that for her and so we're just grateful that we got to be at the olympics She's like a little sister to me. I'm like a brother to her. And I love her family dearly. We've just grown so close over the years because of that. And uh, you know what? It is what it is. Not everybody's meant to come home with a medal and we didn't get one that time. But you know what? We, we left there knowing that we got to be there. The people we went with truly cared about each other. And you can't, there's no price for that. Yeah, agreed. Are you a nudist? Do you live in a nudist community? Do you walk around every day perineal sunbathing? That's when you shine your butthole to the sun and you get sun on your butthole. Apparently, it's very good for you. I'm going to be trying it soon. My wife did it. She said it felt great. Well, if you are, just, just fast forward because you're not going to need to hear what I have to say next because I'm going to talk about Sullen Clothing, one of the sponsors here on the show. So if you're not a nudist and you wear clothing and you love tattoo art, check out SullenClothing.com, the coolest tattoo artist in the world. Put their art on their clothing and the clothing's super rad, highly 
quality made stuff. Half my wardrobe is stolen clothing. So please check them out. They're a sponsor of my show. They're great supporters of the tattoo community and the guys that own it are just great human beings. Thank you so much for listening. I want to talk about your rehab center. But yeah. Before we do that, I'm thinking about you in this speaking thing you're, you do. Mm -hmm. I think I heard you say on another platform, you travel over 200 days out of the year. <clears throat> yep. Planes, hotels, you know, Ubers, all this. Yep. You're a 40 year old man. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm a 52 year old man. But instantly when I heard that, I was just like, ouch, ow. <laughs> you know, yep. I, I know what it feels like to... How do you, first of all, how many years have you been doing it at that pace? Since 2016. Okay, let me help you with the math. So we're on year eight of, of hard. Been speaking for 15 years. But you've been traveling. I'm talking about the travel. 2016, That's yeah. eight hard. You've been going, you got a lot more years of this schedule in you? No. Okay, I, no. I figured you'd say That's, that. And that was what the rehab was all about. You know, Chris Heron, who I, I tell this story, Chris Heron, who is a big speaker or was a big speaker, has an M, uh, was an NBA a superstar, so to speak, before his drug addiction, took him out. He has a 30 for 30 on ESPN. Great story. Inspired me. He's like, are you married? You got kids? And he's like, you're just, you're never going to be if this is what you're going to do. And I just didn't know what to do at that time. And uh, I was at his rehab and he was like, this is what you got to do, Huff. Mm -hmm. And he really inspired me to see that my exit from being on the road was having my own treatment center where I could then devote my life individually to the clients or guests who would stay at my treatment center looking for what I had built in my life. And that was sobriety, serenity, joy, peace, and happiness. Mm -hmm. And it changed why I was saving my money. And really what he did was show me that the speaking could pay you well because of how good you tell your story and how amazing it is but you have to be a steward over that money to then turn around and be able to have the funds to start your own rehab center. And so I don't have many years left. And I've been telling that people actually, I'm, I'm on the cusp of really slowing down speaking and really trying to spend more time with myself, my girlfriend, my family, um, because my family's reaching the fourth quarter of their years, my mother and father, and um, time is just becoming more valuable to me. And I've sacrificed a lot of time for other people. Um, but at the same time, I love it. It's so hard for me to to get away from because I'm able to make such an impact on adults and young people alike. And uh, there's a part of me that will probably always speak, but there's a big part of me that recognizes, you know, 200, 250 days a year on the road is how you can't sustain that. You're still going to make a huge impact with this rehab center. It's a different type of impact. You're going to be able to individualize and focus on singular people versus a big room of people right. where you have impact on a per percentage of them. Sure. But get the case, you know, one-on-ones, you yes. know, so it, it feels right. And you know, it, yeah. And this is your, so this is the next step. It is. And this place, okay. So this place is called, what's it called? I PH have Wellness. All right. What's that stand for? Matt Paz, Tony Hoffman, PH oh, Wellness, OP, okay, Paz yeah. Hoffman, Paz but it's Hoffman. a play on words because our slogan is find your balance. <laughs> BMX. <laughs> yes. <laughs> find your balance. Yes. How long have you had this spot? Two, two years okay. and the end of June. We're very successful. We're absolutely mm. crushing it. Nice. People are coming to our treatment center and have been in and out of treatment centers and rehabs and leave reviews about how special our place is. They have never been to a location where everybody and the in terms of employees and the culture of what we represent is so cohesive. Mm. You know, Matt Paz, my business partner, is a fantastic leader, and I knew he would be because he gets employees to buy in on the vision. Clinically and marketing-wise is what I wanted control of. I wanted to have control over the branding, and I wanted to have control over what the clinical direction looked like of our program. So if you go to the rooms, so much of my sobriety is in there, making my bed, brushing my teeth, and organizing my stuff to start my day. My sobriety model and the pillars that exist for PH Wellness are my sobriety. But what Matt does is he goes in and he really creates the culture of the employees, the expectations that we have and just what we're going to allow and what we're not going to allow, mm -hmm. which allows clients to come in and see that and feel that. We don't want anybody working for us that just needs a paycheck. Mm. We want people to come in and give the hours and time that it takes to change somebody's, somebody's life. And we also want to honor those people. You know, I feel like that's a lost thing in this country is, people open up businesses solely to make money. Mm. And much of this money is not needed. 
what Matt and I really try to do is, is bless our employees that are sacrificing and putting in that work because lives are being changed as a result. You know, we took the company on a dinner last night. We do those dinners all the time. We're really big on bonus structures and incentivizing to make sure that when you show up to work, if you're bought in on the vision, we promise you we're going to take care of you because if we can't change people's lives, then what are we doing here? Mm -hmm. And then we're not effective as a business. It's like you said, if you focus on helping people and being good at helping people, the money follows that. Yeah. And so we really created such a cool place where I'm involved. I do one-on-ones. I run group virtually on the road. Matt's involved. He's out there every week. These clients will leave reviews. These guests will leave reviews. Like, I've never been to a treatment center where you actually see the owners mm. or the owners running group. You know, it's mm. usually a tech that's making a small amount of money that they put in front. But this owner is out here putting his time in, even virtually, to run these groups or do the workouts with these individuals because we have a big fitness component. And so we really have created something special hmm. in a market where there's thousands of treatment centers was, from Orange yeah. County to San Diego, thousands. I'm sure that uh, that industry is littered with just charlatans and shysters that are like, good way to make some cash, man. Well, yeah, because you don't have to have any type of credentials to open up a hmm. treatment center. To hmm. become a surgeon, you have to be a licensed hmm. doctor and surgeon. You have to take tests and go through this process hmm. to even be able to open somebody up. And treatment, all you need is the money. A lot like tattooing. You don't need it. Anyone can do it. And so, yeah, I spend my life separating. I do this, just what you said. It's like, I'm just trying to find the tattoo artists that are um, in it for the right reasons and truly passionate and not, because a lot of people have jumped in lately, I think, because they saw some people making some money. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. So that's cool. That's cool. You're doing the real thing. I would expect nothing less knowing you this short bit already. So fuck. Yeah. Rad. Yeah. And I want to take it across the country. You okay, know, we're going to build more centers. Yes. I'm, we want to do 30 in the Riverside, 30 beds in, in the Riverside area. Okay. Matt's going to control that from a CEO leadership point. And then that's when I'll really start to take a step back from speaking and kind of take a CEO leadership role in the States that we start to open up more pH wellnesses. So I can travel around since I'm used to traveling, mm -hmm. obviously not 250 days a year, mm -hmm. but doing culture work and leadership work with our location, maybe in Georgia, Ohio, West Virginia, and making sure that everybody is cohesively working together so that if you go to Riverside, it's no different than if you go to West Virginia. Mm -hmm. You're going to get the same type of treatment. And that is people that care, people that are invested in you, and people that can truly show you how to achieve recovery and sobriety in the long term. I love it. On that note of sobriety, I want to know how your thoughts around some of the hallucinogenic techniques that are being used. Like for instance, iboga. They have all these iboga centers down in uh, Mexico. Iboga is a highly powerful hallucinogenic from Africa. And it's known to not only help people get off heroin, but to almost stave the craving of it. Like to yeah. me, there's two ways to be sober. One is you just kind of do it the way you did it. It's like willpower and knowing that's not what I want, even though there's got to be a small part of you that still would likes the idea, like your body still could maybe sure. even crave it, but you say no and you stick to it. And you're a kind of guy that has a, a strong willpower, but they say Iboga removes the, the desire for some, for yep. a lot. I mean, you, you've heard of these techniques. Yep. You, and we hear a lot about microdosing. Yeah. Using uh, the yeah. ingredient in magic mushrooms. Yeah. Psilocybin. Um, psilocybin. Yeah. I'm open to letting the science um, develop mm -hmm. more understanding of how it can be used and, and, and using it mm -hmm. so long as the science supports its use. There's some um, good science. It's, yeah. It's, and there it's is. Better. It's starting to show up in these conferences that I go to. Mm -hmm. uh, psilocybin is, they're, they're starting to have conferences around microdosing. Mm -hmm. And it's benefits for, for and it's benefits for depression and mm -hmm. energy mm -hmm. and uh, anxiety and how it can help those things. And so I'm not one that's against those. Okay, I'm not one that's pouring into it and saying, you know, that's what we do at our treatment center. Mm -hmm. But I'm also not one to say don't do that. Everybody's got to find their pathway. I am against the California sober thing. You know, if what's you, that? Well, if you're a drinker, you don't drink. You smoke weed. Oh. But you still want to say you're in recovery. How about just you just smoke weed? Okay. Because for those of us who don't use any substances to alter our mood, it, it muddies the water. You don't have to be in recovery. How about you found something that works for you instead of calling it sober? I just smoke weed now. I don't yeah. use heroin. Yeah, I there should be, there should be two different things. It's two different things. Two different things. And it shouldn't be the same. It, 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 you want to be a part of recovery, then there's a process of being a part of recovery. 
medicated assistant treatment can be a part of recovery, mm -hmm. but those meds are specific for opioids or withdrawals um, or comfort meds in the beginning stages of detox. But a maintenance marijuana program to me is more or less you just smoke weed. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not going to tell anybody to their face, you're not sober. Mm -hmm. That's just how I feel. You do what you do and that's okay. And the hallucinogen things, I'm open to it because I've know I've read a lot of stuff that say there are some huge benefits to it. So mm -hmm. I won't take that from somebody if they wanted to try that and they did find huge benefits from it. I predict they're going to find their way into those centers. I, I, I don't know. You know, I just, I, I'm, I'm a big believer. Of course, time, to, to, as long as the science will support right. it, it will find its way into mm -hmm. what, uh, some and type of pharmaceutical. Therapy. Ketamine, ketamine, ketamine therapy is yeah. another one. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of different things that are being done on the, um, the progressive side of like stretching yeah. out what we know and trying to know more to help people. True. It's very true. Well, my friend, this is a, a I've had an absolute best time with you today. Absolutely. Um, I love what you're doing. I love your your positive. The, your your mission in life is to help others, and and man, the world could certainly use a lot more people like you for Thank sure. You. Yeah. Thank you. Is there anything we missed? Anything no. You need to shout out or no? You know what? Phwellness.com. Okay. If you're somebody that's struggling with addiction or has a loved one struggling with addiction, Phwellness.com. Reach out to us. Okay. We'd love to help you. If you wanted to contact me specifically, you could find me on Instagram, Tony M. Hoffman. Same with TikTok. I'm not as active on TikTok. Tony M. M. Letter Hoffman. M as in mother. Yep. And then uh, Facebook, Tony Hoffman Speaking mm -hmm. is my Facebook page. I'm on LinkedIn as well. And X is Tony M. Hoffman. But I make myself very accessible on social media and, and, and communicate with people. So if you were inspired and you just wanted to leave me a note, you're probably going to get a response from me. There's a 99% chance of that. Just saying thank you for taking the time to to share that with me because that does mean a lot to me. So thank you guys for bringing me in here and wow. having such a good conversation that wasn't just solely about me telling my timeline that just really looked for introspect and 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 these parts of me being able to tell Smokey's story, I think is really cool too. Cool. Yeah, cool. so thank you. You're welcome. That's the way I like to do it, man. Uh, you do your professional speaking already plenty and yeah. I wanted to get inside and see what Tony's really about. That's right. On a deeper level. And I think we got that today. So thank you. my pleasure, my pleasure. All right, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. All the likes, the shares, the subscriptions from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for tuning into this episode and stay tuned for the next one. Peace out.